lawyers, law students, judges, paralegals, legal admins, if you're in the legal space, then the Lawyer Suppression Project is an option for you. And it's also not just about depression. So, Sarah, I'm really excited that you're here for the You Are Lawyer podcast. Thank you for being a guest. And I just have to jump right in. You are about to graduate with your master's in social work. And so social work, you are a lawyer podcast. How do the two connect or intersect? The two have an amazing intersection that they actually have a lot more in common than I initially thought they would. Macro level, the organizational aspects of social work, such as running a nonprofit, as well as the micro level, such as working individual with individual clients in a therapeutic practice. So social work you know, gives you a full range of ways to serve your community in the same way that law does. So what was it that initially sparked your interest in social work? Um, well, it actually, I came to social work um, with a desire to be a therapist specifically for professionals. And the University of Tennessee social work program uh, was local to me. And I went to the University of Tennessee for law school. So it kind of seemed like a natural progression as part of my education. And since I got there, seeing all the different ways that it is applicable to the community, whether that community is your local community or the legal community, um, is has really been amazing in a way that getting a traditional degree through counseling or psychology might not necessarily um, give you that well-rounded perspective. So you mentioned law school in Tennessee, and you're also licensed in Tennessee. Yes, I I will hold on to my license for the foreseeable future. (laughs) Okay. So what did you study in undergrad? Were you always thinking ahead to social work or um, even psychology or anything like that? No. Well, I always have had an interest in psychology ever since I was little, but everything else just happened by accident. I got my uh, undergraduate degree in music business. And as I studied music business, I actually wanted to manage bands back in the day. And the more classes I took, the more I saw a legal component to them. And then as part of my program, we were required to take copyright law, which I absolutely fell in love with which sent me on my path to law school and then a decade in uh, IP litigation, mainly music copyright suits. And then, you know, just going through being a, a practicing attorney and the challenges that practicing attorneys face with the culture or mental health stigma, the messages that we get sent, you know, became the actual field of practice became less attractive to me and moving into you know my my childhood desire to be in mental health became more attractive um and I eventually just made that transition about two years ago okay and how long did you practice law how many years about 10 years oh okay so this is what I love about this podcast (laughs) interest in music and managing bands that sparks an interest in the law you practice for 10 years and you say But there's even still more to this, right? There's a Mm -hmm. social work aspect. It was that copyright course that sparked Mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. So actually, because I did music copyright litigation, a lot of what I learned in undergrad ended up being applicable on the cases I worked on. You know, my biggest case was the Blurred Lines case with, you know, Marvin Gaye's got to give it up and up and thick and yeah, and and thick. blurred lines. And we re-represented Marvin Gaye's you know, family in that case. Pretty typical of what I did. So learning about music history, learning about music production, learning about how the music business works definitely came into play when you're dealing with music business clients on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm sitting here shaking my head because I'm actually a little jealous because (laughs) copyright was an elective in law school and I never took it. And then I ended up working in IP law and I wish I had that background. So I love that you had real life experiences that Mm -hmm. then transferred to law school. Yeah, I definitely didn't expect to end up there when I started undergrad, but it did lay a great foundation. So you ended up working in IP litigation Mm -hmm. and you did it for 10 years. Was it as exciting and as entertaining as you were expecting? It was actually when I was doing the actual work, it was what I was looking for. The the hours were long. Work was hard. You know, I definitely spent, you know, seven days a week at the office, which looking back is just 
a bit much and one of the reasons I did make a change. Um, but the work itself was really rewarding um, and really fascinating. All right. So I have to ask, because before the recording, we were talking about Florida. You're actually in Coral Gables, Coral Springs, Florida right now. Mm -hmm. But you went to law school and are licensed in Tennessee. When did you mm -hmm. move to Florida? We moved this past summer. And my, fortunately, my social work program has an online program. So I was able to move from being in person in Tennessee and continue with the same program and same professors and same classes online. And so I've been going from the in class, you know, traditional in class environment to the kind of new age online environment, which has been an, an odd transition, but it's also been allowed for a lot of like life flexibility, which has been great. And also, you know, the weather down here is amazing. You get to sit out by the pool <laughs> 365 days a year. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, I know the weather in Florida is a lot better than in Tennessee. It's like 70 degrees and I have an electric blanket on. <laughs> so I, it's funny that you're in Coral Gables because my best friend lives in, she lived in um, West Palm Beach and she used to just always tell people, oh, just South Florida, just South Florida. And I'm like, no, where are you? And she's like, you'll never find it on a map. Um, but now she actually is in Coral Springs. Are you in Coral Springs? You're in Coral, I'm in Coral Springs. Springs. Yeah. So I think she's like either right around there or around the corner. Um, yeah. That's funny. So I live in Coral Springs and I work in West Palm Beach. Oh my gosh. Yes. So do you have yeah. to commute for work or you work remotely? Only three days a week, but it okay. is like about an hour, hour and a half, depending upon traffic. Yeah, it's a lot. that's but crazy. I go, through a lot. I go through a lot of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, really cool. Um, so I've always daydreamed about going to school or getting another degree after law school. How was the work? How was the work that you're doing for your master's program, knowing that you're coming from this strenuous thing with law school and even the bar exam? Okay, it's it's nothing by comparison. Um, I hate this. I hate to say that, but get to have dinner with my husband every night. I generally uh, do not work past seven or even 5 p.m. most days I do if I need to, but it's very different from law school. Uh, you know, one of the skills that going to law school and being a lawyer taught you about, you know, managing your time and getting work done. And then the rigors are not quite the same. Um, there's no curve. There's no end of year one massive paper that that or exam that makes or breaks your entire grade. So it's a very different environment. And plus it being in the mental health space, it's a much more supportive and encouraging space as well. I always assume that because of the rigor and the competition and just the sheer madness of law school, anything else, maybe would accept it to a PhD program would probably be much, much better. So, um, so Sarah, what is the Lawyer's Depression Project and why were you involved with that? The Lawyer's Depression Project, and thanks for asking about that. It is a peer support group for legal professionals, lawyers, law students, judges, paralegals, legal admins. If you're in the legal space, then the Lawyer's Depression Project is an option for you. And it's also not just about depression. Any mental health concern, behavioral health concern, day-to-day -day stressors of being in the legal field, Lawyer Suppression Project can provide peer support through weekly, you know, Zoom meetings, chat discussion, you know, discussion boards, chats, a variety of ways for you to, you know, anyone in need to interact. And it's a free and confidential service um, led by trained facilitators who are also attorneys. Is that something that you found? during your social work practice, or did you find that when you were in litigation? Lawyer Suppression Project was founded in 2019, and I joined in September of this past year, and I just learned about it about a year or so ago when I was really, maybe a little longer than that, when I was first starting to really explore the lawyer well-being space and what options there were out there. And I just happened to come across it and reached out to their president, Julia Clayton, to learn a little bit about what it was like, and through various conversations with her and doing a little research for them here and there, I was eventually asked to join their board and their executive committee. 
and then since then have been involved with the organization and, you know, trying to uh, expand its services and its reach and just be there for as many people who need it. Yeah, and I think that's so really cool. I mean, for one, the name is so simple. People will definitely remember it. And I'll make sure I put that here on the screen for everyone that's watching (laughs) the YouTube video. And for everyone that's just listening to the podcast, thank you so much for listening. And we will include all of the links to these um, organizations that we're talking about in the show notes. So what I loved about the Lawyer Suppression Project is that mental health is such a big deal for lawyers, whether we Mm -hmm. want to accept it or talk about it or not, right? And so I think it was absolutely brilliant that they created this project in 2019 Mm -hmm. and that it's still going and it's even thriving. Lawyers are signing up, you know, paralegals are looking into and they're like, whoa, you know, I think you might need this, right? It's kind of opening up the conversation for more lawyers to even consider this might be me. Yeah, I mean, it is mental health struggles are so common in law. Fortunately, the messages out there are changing. You know, when I was in law school, it was very much about these issues are inevitable and don't tell anyone about it because you're going to risk your law license. That message has changed completely of saying you're not alone. There is help. Help does help. And there's a way to you know, successfully manage, you know, struggles because you're a human being and be a thriving attorney. And, you know, I hope that having this free resource for individuals can really help those who, you know, need a space to open up with people who understand or, you know, might just be starting their career and need, a, you know, a free service. But mental health concerns in law are rampant. You know, there's studies that talk about how when law students enter law school, their rates of depression are on par with the national average. But by their third year, 40% of law students are depressed. Um, Another recent study out of Australia talked about how 58% of law students are experiencing mental health distress. And the message behind that is you're not alone. You're not the only one. And it's okay to reach out because if 40 or 60 or 70 plus percent of people are having trouble, then the odds are that most of the people in the room with you are, and you shouldn't be afraid to share what you're going through. Absolutely. I'm sitting over here vigorously nodding my head. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, I can, I resonate with that because, you know, the law is such a noble profession, but being a lawyer and even preparing to be a lawyer is a huge responsibility. And we get so wrapped up in the, oh my gosh, I just got to keep going that when you sit back and look, you're like, how did I do that for three years? It's like mind blowing that we even made it out, made it out successfully and that people weren't talking about these issues, right? You were just waiting for that big party at the end of the semester to blow off the steam or kind of to like reset you. Mm -hmm. But then you didn't really have time to deal with your mental health because you had to get into the next semester or you had to get into the bar exam. Yeah, I'm really happy that um, people are starting to talk about this a lot more. So, Sarah, I have to ask, you wanted to be a therapist. You're studying social work, and you also Mm -hmm. have this legal background and copyright. Are you going to create a business or something that includes (laughs) all of those? Or, like, what do you think is going to happen once you graduate with this degree? Um, I don't know if it will include my IP background other than just being... (laughs) knowing not to steal images from the internet to create my eventual website. But yeah, I want to, my eventual goal is to have a practice that caters to attorneys and other professionals who are struggling um, to give them, you know, a resource of someone who understands what they've been through, someone who can, you know, they can identify with their day-to-day struggles and someone who's, you know, aware of additional resources that are out there for them. Um, and also, you know, serve as an advocate for attorneys in general and for in- the institutional changes that we need to make at state bar level, at the lawyer assistance program level, at the law firm level, at the law school level, because it's a systemic problem that we have um, at every level of practice, you know, as, as one one person referred to it is the transference of suffering. And, 
we have previous uh, generations who are kind of passing on expectations that were on them, the same environments that they were in, uh, rather than realizing that for us to be healthy as a community, that things do need to change. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know what it is about lawyers that we just don't want to make that change, but you have to, Mm -hmm. you know, I've said it before on an episode where every other industry changes, look at medicine. You know, it's not like people were saying, I never had anesthesia when I had surgery, so you can't have it now. (laughs) But lawyers were like, I took the bar exam, so you have to take it. That can change. I never talked about mental health, so you can't either. That can change, right? Mm -hmm. All of these things can change. Um, Absolutely. You know, we can make changes because it won't just benefit the next generation. It will benefit us now to make time for ourselves, to make time for our mental health, to be able to just take a walk or eat lunch outside of the office without guilt. You know, it doesn't even have to be revolutionary change, which would be great. But even small changes can make a massive difference in everyone's lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I I would like to believe that some of the fear is just that we don't know what it'll look like, but that's okay. We can lean into the unknown and we can create it, you know? Absolutely. So, so Sarah, my last question for today is, do you have any advice for any law students or new lawyers, lawyers who've been practicing for five years or less about what they can do in their legal career? Oh, wow. That's that's a great question. Um, I would say for law students, really think about the environment you want to practice in and not just the job you want and make sure that the job you take will support you, will support you as a human being, won't put unreasonable expectations on you, regardless of the paycheck that comes with it, because I promise you later on, you're you will not care about the money as much. I mean, granted, we all need money to survive, but it's okay to wait to take the right job rather than take the first thing that comes or rather than take the thing that has the the highest paycheck with it really in the long run over the next, you know, 40, 50 years of your career, however long that you're going to practice your mental health, your physical health, your family health, that matters more than the new car that you want. That matters more than, believe it or not, paying off your student loans quickly, which super important, but (laughs) let me tell you, those student loans are gonna be around a lot longer than you think, no matter how much you make. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really, really great point. Well, Sarah, I really appreciate you being a guest on the You Are Lawyer podcast. If you guys are watching and you enjoyed this conversation, please leave a comment. Let me know if you have any questions for Sarah. I will get those over to her. And if you are listening to the podcast, again, thank you so much. If you're interested in seeing what both of us look like, feel free to go to the YouTube channel, search Kyla Denano, and you can watch the interview with Sarah Ellis as well as other interviews with lawyers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So bye, Sarah. You have a great day. Thank you so much for having me. Uh Uh-huh. Bye.